We describe the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and toxicodynamic properties of antifungal agents. Now let's explain the pathophysiology and clinical presentation of candidiasis and aspergillosis. Now let's take a look at mortality due to invasive mycoses. Candida species uh, typically cause the least amount of uh, mortality, but still pretty significant. So 10 to 20% mortality rate in invasive candidiasis. And the rate of mortality goes up, uh, you know, especially once we get to the mold. So aspergillus species, you get significantly higher, per, you know, in the 40% mortality rate uh, for a lot of, uh, patients and that's because uh, you know these uh, as you go up the ladder uh, up, up the steps here these infections occur as the level of immunosuppression increases so you know for most uh, patients with intact immuno uh, immune system these infections just do not occur so these are mostly opportunistic uh, so you know uh, mucoralis fusarium these are invasive molds and especially when it's resistant, not only is the patient immunocompromised, but also antifungals may not be active. So that's why the rate of mortality goes off the roof. Now let's focus on candidiasis. So drug-resistant candidiasis uh, has been a, a serious threat per the CDC uh, levels of th emerging threats. And you can see different species of candida. So candida albican causes the most of infections followed by, uh, and this is specifically in the blood. Uh, in fact, candidiasis is a umbrella term referring to both cutaneous mucosal and uh, deep seated uh, organ infections. Invasive candidiasis specifically refers to uh, not only bloodstream infection, but also deep-seated infection. So bloodstream infection uh, would be called candidemia, and deep-seated infections include things like intra-abdominal abscess due to fungal uh, species, um, osteomyelitis, endocarditis, etc. Okay, so in the blood for candidemia, C. albican causes the most uh, uh, incidence, followed by C. glabrata, and then prapsilosis, tropicalis, uh, you know, and then the rest of them are uh, pretty much uh, low rate. Now, among healthcare associated bloodstream infections, candida actually rank in the, you know, top three or four. Uh, in fact, uh, Staphylococcus aureus is number one and then quag negative staph. And then, uh, you know, between enterococcus and candida would be, uh, you know, the next that cause uh, bloodstream infections. And mortality is pretty high, so 10 to 20% mortality due to candidemia. And the most common individual risk factors include indwelling central venous catheter, exposure to broad spectrum antibacterial agents. So, you know, another reason for antimicrobial stewardship is that in addition to all the other collateral damage, it also increases the risk of uh, uh, candidemia. Other risks include long-term ICU stay with or without assisted uh, ventilation, recent uh, major surgery, uh, necrotizing pancreatitis, any type of dialysis, uh, TPN, and uh, of course, immunosuppression. Now, let's look at invasive candidiasis. So, candida colonization is regarded as a prerequisite for subsequent infection. So, in fact, um, you know, typically through the intestines. So pe people can be colonized in the intestines with um, candida species as part of the flora, uh, you know, and then if somebody has peritonitis, for example, if they have surgery, uh, you know, any type of uh, colon uh, surgery, this can actually have leakage and uh, these uh, candida can find their way into the bloodstream and then cause uh, candidemia. Another uh, path could be, you know, if somebody has a catheter for long term, uh, through the catheter, these uh, candida species from the outside, uh, you know, if they're colonized on the skin, for example, they can find their ways into the blood and cause candidemia. And of course, you can also have, you know, uh, it's not uncommon, especially for women to have a vaginal uh, candidiasis. And then you can have an ascending route. So from the bladder, the candida can find its way to the kidneys and cause pyelonephritis. And then, of course, from 
the kidneys it can easily go into the blood and cause candidemia but regardless of how it finds its way into the blood then the blood goes of course to every organ and then it can infect other organs and that's what we refer to as deep-seated candidiasis so for example it can in, uh, infect the spleen and cause abscess it can cause the liver and cause abscess there uh, the eyes can often be involved uh, you know so the, it can cause some serious infections in the eye uh, of course the lungs can be you know you can have abscess in the lung and of course uh, osteomyelitis Now let's take a look at how to screen and diagnose it. So of course, uh, you know, uh, invasive candidiasis should be suspected in people who have those risk factors. So the risk factors are what uh, will be screened in patients. Now it is estimated that about 15% of patients with candidemia have manifestations of ocular involvement. So it is recommended by IDSA to have a dilated fundoscopic examination performed by ophthalmologists. Uh, so anytime somebody has candidemia. When it comes to blood culture, it is important to note that candida grows slower than most bacteria. So, you know, when uh, we have blood cultures for bacteria, typically we get the gram stain uh, pretty much the same day. For candida, it may take uh, a couple days before we can even get the um, grams uh, or any type of staining on the, under microscopy so uh, so you know that delays the process uh, and one rapid diagnostic that we have is the t2 candida panel that can detect uh, you know not every candida species but it can detect five most uh, common candida and it does report them in groups so it might not be able to tell you exactly which of these five the patient has uh, but it says, you know, one of the two in a group and it can do it from the whole blood. So you don't have to wait for two days for it to grow, uh, for the colonies to be put on this test. Uh, it can be directly from the whole blood. Now, outside of the blood, the diagnosis is essentially dependent on uh, culture and or a positive histopathology from normally sterile sites. Uh, such as intra-abdominal or intra-thoracic sites. Now let's switch gear to aspergillosis. So aspergillus uh, conidia or spores are ubiquitous in the environment. So they're everywhere in the soil and, uh, you know, any, uh, any moist uh, material, especially material that are decaying, um, you know, organic material. Now the primary route of infection is through inhalation. So uh, P pretty much most aspergillosis infections are pulmonary aspergillosis although uh, extra pulmonary pulmonary extra pulmonary aspergillosis can occur but it's not as common clinical manifestations of disease are largely dependent on host immune response in general aspergillosis is broken into three uh, types so there is invasive aspergillosis for example pulmonary aspergillosis there is chronic forms of aspergillosis and then there is the allergic form of aspergillosis. Uh, we are going to focus on invasive pulmonary aspergillosis uh, in this course. Now, one thing that's important to understand about the pathophysiology is that once, uh, you know, these uh, uh, aspergillus species are inhaled in the lungs, once they start to grow, uh, the aspergillus hyphae may invade the pulmonary arterioles and they can lead to ischemic necrosis, intravascular thrombosis, and hemorrhagic uh, pulmonary infarct due to rapid hyphal growth. So one thing that you will see is, uh, you know, um, hemoptysis might be as, uh, one of the symptoms of uh, pulmonary aspergillosis so essentially blood coming out of the the lung here here are the common aspergillus species so pretty much most of these are due to aspergillus uh, fumigatus for pulmonary aspergillosis as well as aspergillus uh, flavus 
Uh, there are some that are not commonly seen in the lungs. So for example, aspergillus niger is more common in burn wounds. Now, classic risk factors for aspergillosis include prolonged, profound neutropenia. So essentially, absolute neutrophil count uh, under 100. Uh, neutrophil dysfunction, hematologic malignancy, and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, as well as prolonged glucocorticoid and immunosuppression therapy. And then these are classic, but emerging risk factors include uh, critically ill patients, so anyone in the ICU, uh, COPD, uh, solid organ transplantation, HIV infection, and viral co-infections such as CMV, influenza, and most recently SARS-CoV-2, and of course liver disease. So symptoms of pulmonary aspergillosis include dry cough, shortness of breath, uh, chest pain and hemoptysis. Uh, patients can be pretty ill with uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, and hypoxia. Uh, now, fever may or may not be there because typically patients who get this, they're already immunocompromised. So because, uh, you know, they're immunocompromised, they may not be able to respond with the fever. So that's why fever might not be there. Now, the gold standard for diagnosis is uh, histopathology examination and culture of a surgical lung biopsy. Now, we do have a couple of assays, so galactomannan and uh, beta glucan that can be detected in some patients with invasive. However, they're not, uh, you know, very specific. So, uh, you know, they could be positive due to other fungal infections, but this is something that can be used to for example, uh, see if the patient is responding uh, to antifungal therapy. Now, this is just FYI, but something that's classic about aspergillosis is that on a CT imaging, uh, there is uh, often the halo sign that uh, you know people talk about on rounds. So when you hear the halo sign, they're essentially they're looking at a CT imaging uh, and that's what they see and that's essentially a, cent a central uh, nodule surrounded by ground glass opacity that rep uh, represents the hemorrhage and then another thing that you will see one or two weeks later is the air crescent sign and that's essentially the retracted and infarcted lung uh, 